So I want to give a little apology first, and it's not because I'm going to be coughing into the microphone. So the code of conduct of the conference says, sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any conference venue, including talks, workshop, parties, Twitter, and other online media. I'm going to show you some boobs. Not my specifically, but you know, there will be boobs. And it is true what all the other speakers said, that it is really dark. So do you have a phone? Everybody has a phone, come on. So I want to know how many people here are female. And I can't see your hand, so you have, to, you have to get your phone to light up. And you have to hold it for long now so I can take a picture. Female. That's not a lot, is it? OK. Male. Phone, phone, phone. Oh, I can see your hands. I can see you moving. I can see it. Oh, it's a lot more male. OK. How many people here are Italian? Well, OK. A lot. So that's great. So I, I don't actually usually talk about this. My background is not in gender. Um, as a background as a designer, but the organizer saw that I did this talk years ago, so invited me back to do the same talk. I quite enjoyed doing it because, you know, I talk about design, I talk about user experience every day in my work. I want to talk about something I'm passionate about. <laughs> so, for the people who don't speak Italian, patatina. Do you know what it means? Does anybody want to say, any Italian would like to tell me, or tell the crowd? So they have three different meanings. It means a small potato, or a crisp, or a pretty, cute, fuckable girl, or a vagina. So when I lived in Milan, and I worked with a lot of Italian colleagues, and they were really lovely people, I, quite, I love Italians. And then I met this guy, he was so dreamy, his name was Roberto. And then Roberto always called me Patatina. But he calls his little nieces Patatina, too. So I'm like, I don't really understand. Is he flirting with me? Or is he not flirting with me? Is this, is this OK? Is this sexism? I don't really understand. So then I had a lot of discussion with my colleagues. And um, we, we never figured it out. Let's put it this way. But, you know, and that's the origin of the talk of why I think sexism is kind of it's kind of like a casual thing that you talk about. When I was maybe growing up, about five, my mom said to me, Kathy, you have to behave like a proper girl. You know, your legs have to cross a very certain way. When you walk, you have to walk a very certain way. So when you grow up, you can marry a doctor or a lawyer. I don't really, you know, my background is Asian, generic Asian traditionalness, but like I don't really know how to respond to that. And how would you actually respond to it, really? It's like, you know, like the stereotype of the doctor or lawyer is a very nice thing. So what I said to my mom when I was five, I'm like, mom, why can't I just become a doctor or a lawyer? And why do I have to behave like a girl to marry anyone? It's like, I should just be, it should be fine. So always very clear of that. When I got a little older, I was maybe 12. Um, I wanted to marry a tree. And you know, it was during my younger years, I thought I uh, lying in the park all the time, the comfort that the tree brought me, and the kind of shelter that it gave me. I got to see the world. I got to see the sun through the leaves. And it was so beautiful. And I wanted to marry a tree. And this is really important to me at that point, because I realized that there was really no gender. There's the perception of gender when you're younger, when you're without any pollution, I would say pollution, of the world. It's really pure. And then that innocence about gender is something that I kind of want to get back. I want to have that again. So that's me. Uh, a little bit about me is that I do user experience. I usually consult for large enterprises to do digital transformation project. I do service design. I do business design. I do very businessy things. But the only reason that I am explaining this to you, one part, that there's a Twitter handle. If you take a picture, can you 
put it on Twitter so I can have it later, please. <laughs> and the second part is I've been working in the tech industry my whole life for the last 10, 12 years in all different kind of organization in creative agencies with engineers, working with designers in all the different ways. I am, I, I, and we know that this is an industry that is predominantly male, as we can see in the room. And that's okay, you know, it's something that happens. But I talk a lot about the empathy role. What is the empathy role? It's kind of like, Kathy, can you book the follow-up meeting? Well, you know, I'm the director, you know, I don't know why you're asking me to book the meeting. It's not so much about, you know, the lack of project manager, it's more about women in general, they're more caring, they have the ability to organize things, that's why maybe that you see more secretaries, they're female. And then the, you know, the empathy that naturally comes in a woman that you would probably cling up more often than others. And then so I would probably end up booking the meetings most of the time, and I still do it sometimes. I try to avoid it, but it is okay. This is the kind of gender role that is so embedded in how we are. And kind of as an occupational hazard that I see everything as a research project. I think that life is a big, long research, and you know, I have such a sensitive heart that everything I see and everything I do every day that it touches me in a different way. And then that this casual sexism that happens every day, I feel it every day. And so I started a research project about it, basically. Um, this is a quote that I always put in all the different talks I talk about, that, about design thinking. You have to have context. You always design a thing by considering in a larger context. You know, a chair in a room, a room in a building, a building in a city, and so on. This is context, and I think that a lot of different speakers have talked about it, you know, throughout the two days, about how you're supposed to build context and understand things. So, we can look at sexism in a more contextual way. This is the way that I have tried to study it myself. So we can learn about context, the shift, and then we reflect, and then we can look into the future. Because there's no point of looking into the past if we don't look into the future. So we look about the context. What does gender actually mean? There's a project that was done by this photographer, and this is still an ongoing project that went for a long time, I think maybe 2011, until now she's still doing it. And uh, she photographed kids around the world in different culture, different background, about what their room looks like. It's very pink and very blue, and that's just how it is. And we look back into the history of how culture has shifted and how it was before, how we used to be objectified as women, like, you know, how do you put women in ads? And then, maybe in a more modern time, this is an example, this is a real thing, it's called a Honda Fit, and then that is, advertised and actually manufactured in Japan, that it blocks out 99% of the UV ray so that you can comfortably drive it to buy grocery without getting a suntan. So thoughtful, and it's so pink, it's so lovely. So, <laughs> I'm allowed to laugh at my own joke. <laughs> I think it's, it's, this is just generally what happens. And then I guess, uh, you know, marketers, back in the days that they see, okay, there's a different market that we can market. Did you know that women account for 85% of the consumer purchases of health products? Like, everything, really. Well, so, this is what happened. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using ladies' scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. I have it. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamond. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. I love the commercial. You know why? Because there's a naked dude, and he has things I like in his hands. Oh. It's really great, you know, uh, it makes sense. A male product, uh, you use female. 
audience because you know that the female audience is going to be the one that buying it. But then the funny thing is that there's also this kind of thing. I promise boobs, here comes boobs. It's Kay Upton, in case you're wondering. Boobs. Anybody want a burger? So, I don't really understand, to be honest. It's like, I can understand why you put a naked man because you know that the female are supposed to buy all the, the male hygiene product. But I guess it's like eating burgers is probably a man thing. Looking at boobs probably make you want to eat burgers more. True. I think I will like a burger after looking at how she eats burgers. It's just nice, isn't it? So there's a shift in the market that we kind of move on from this kind of more like this kind of very precise sexism. Like we're looking at a very specific market, the LGBT market, that they actually spend more than a million in media spend in the States a year just for the specific target audience, which is lovely. And then we are getting to see different campaigns to actually promote sexual equality in young kids, okay? Fun girls. Hi, Aaron. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. I don't care. <laughs> Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. I should have got Pierre to come up and do this with me. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aw. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. My name is Dakota, and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. I have goosebumps, because I'm a girl. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. I really, really like that campaign. I think, well, it is a female product, you know, always, right? It's a female hygiene product where they put blue liquid on things so males don't get very uh, uncomfortable when watching the advertisement on TV. But well, that's, the, we'll leave it at that. Um, but yeah, it's really nice, you know, that we have this thing where we are trying to raise awareness in, a, in general society that we're moving forward. For the last time when I gave the talk in 2012 to now, there's a lot of new campaign happening. And then we also have to look at gender in the different places. And this is an ad launched by UN Women about gender equality in different places. Because in some parts of the world, and like many parts in the Middle East that I have been to, I have personally met female who have very little right, basically. Did you know that in some Middle East countries for a rape charge to be a real charge, it means that five men have to say that it is a crime that actually happened? So it means you have to get gang banged by five guys and then all five of them decide to come to their senses and say, yes, we, we did a gang bang and we raped her. So that 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 is actually true, um, which is very sad. But there are a lot of different campaigns to try to raise awareness of that. We have a very different spectrum of the kind of awareness that we need to raise. And there are many, many organizations that is doing it. This is just you know, some of them. And a lot of them are starting to say, you know what, I think we have to talk about gender equality in a way that would bring male into the conversation, right? Are you insulting your sister? You know, this is just part of it. But I think that maybe there's more to that. Like, this is what I think. I've been looking for examples of what it means to have male advocating for it. Um, this is a very nice quote uh, from a very famous feminist about we began to raise our daughter more like sons, but we don't have yet actually raised our sons like daughters which is so true. 
Because it's not so much just about having the guys having the awareness of gender equality, of feminism, of fighting for girls. It's one part about this is how do you bring up the culture like in a male so that he will understand what it is like to treat women and what does it mean to be different and to be male. So we're going to do an exercise. I know you guys are pretty quiet so far, you know. But hey, I try to speak Italian and I open with Italian words, so you know, maybe we can try. So what does a man look like? Oh, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a wrong slide. Because you probably get really confused, it's pink, sorry. Um, <laughs> what, does, uh, what does a man look like? Oh. So if you want to give me an example of a man, who would it be? Oh, come on. Okay, here's a little more inspiration, okay. A trucks, muscle, yeah. No? So, who? Guns, yeah. Fuck yeah, I'm USA. No, anyways, yeah. Anyways, um, this is what men really look like in the society that we live in. This is how they're portrayed. Um, kind of, right? Isn't it? Why? What's so funny? Which one are you laughing at? Yeah, you see? Muscles, guns, trucks, underwear, greasy muscles. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I'm okay. oh, sorry. Distracted. But we Stop also heard this. Woman. Are you a girl? Boys don't cry. Okay? Are you a girl? Why are you crying? Don't behave like a girl. Boys don't cry. So, boys don't cry. This is how we have raised our kids in so many different cultures, in so many different references. Men, you're supposed to be tough. Why aren't you toughen up? Why don't you men up? Like, why don't you, you know, not cry? That's, that's really rude. Like, imagine telling that to a five-year-old. Men up. And I feel very strongly about this because I come from a kind of traditional background. And my sister have two sons. And I don't know why they say this to their sons and that the son was crying. And he's about like three-year-old. And then she said to him, you have to stop crying because only little girls cry. And if you keep crying, we might as well cut off your penis so that you could just become a little girl. I don't, I don't think that we need to have that kind of gender stereotype since such a young age. There was a very funny campaign. I think this was just a provocative thing that they do uh, about gender equality about, from the men's point of view. So I'm not going to hold the door. I'm going to hold your bags. I'm not going to give you my seat. Which, this is a bit pushing it really, you know, it's like there's, how do you really define that kind of very subtle line of what is culture and what is moving forward? And that's what I really want to talk about. The culture that we have, you know, across the globe in different ways in the past that has happened, it has informed, influences and changes our behavior. And it's inevitable. Like, this is something that happens. But this is the context that we have to build on. This is the history of how it has been. And it's OK. We look at the context, and we look at how we can move on. So I started looking at a lot of leadership books when I was young in my career. I'm like, I really believe that I can have it all. I'm a female. Am I going to have kids? Am I going to have a career? Am I going to get married? Am I going to do all of it? I think I would like to do all of it. And I'm trying to find an example of leadership in that kind of way. I read about some, you know, leadership books about women, very specific, you know, slightly less than, you know, generic leadership books. I even found like very specific ones about how women of color can succeed in corporate America. Very specific. I'm like, oh yeah, I really like that. There's also another one called How to Work Successfully with Black Colleagues and Customers. It's, I'm, I'm not making this up. This is a real book. 
um, the reviews weren't great, but there's one review that is actually gave it five stars and said, oh my gosh, people are not actually looking at the value of this book. This is a real book. So it's really weird because there's kind of this segmentation of how things are segmented. You know, there's the generic crowd, and then there's the female crowd, and then there's maybe the color crowd. And then, but why isn't there a specific kind that is more catered toward a male? Such a book like Understanding Your Male Ego, How to Become a Better Leader Because Understanding Your Male Ego, which is a real thing. It could be a real thing. Uh, have you seen the show The Office? Most horrible boss ever. You know, um, yeah. So since I last gave this talk, I've been working on this book with somebody. Actually, we started writing chapters as, as a joke, but uh, we did start writing it. But this is the funny thing that the segmentation has been this way. And this is the context we're building on. Now how do we move onwards and going forward with this? Well, I'll talk about the different gender shift of how it has shifted throughout the times that, to synthesize it a little bit. We're talking about different boundaries, identities, and complexity. The boundary of gender is kind of becoming more blurry. Sheryl Sandberg, very fantastic. Did you know that there are a lot more men that would stay at home and be a stay at home dad now than before? And then, of course, now it's a lot more acceptable for a woman. Did you see that? Um, Marisa Mayer, CEO of Yahoo, she is pregnant with twins, I believe, twins. And she said that she's only going to take two weeks off. And people got really, really, really angry. But if you consider the same thing in some countries, you know, countries not like Sweden where the male can have paternity leave, you know, like, why is it so bad a female says she's going to go back to work two weeks after? The, the dude probably doesn't even take time off to look at the delivery, maybe, you know, it's like, but we have a different gender boundaries now that is more blurry, and then that is it's a boundary that we can push back and forth. And gender identity, and by moving forward, this is a photo series by a photographer, Mr. Toledo, he photographed these people who have gone through very severe plastic surgery to look like whatever they want to look like. So there's a very fluid transformation about the way we look, about how we want to look, about what is perceived as beauty. You know, this is something that the gender identity, that is not something that a man has to look like the muscle and the oil on his body and all of that. But that's the identity. Look at gender complexity. That this is gender is becoming a casual lifestyle choice. So the, for the photograph here is actually um, a transgender child. Which is like when I first read about it, I was a little surprised about it. But why wouldn't you let the child decide how he or she wants to grow up? So this child who basically that before they have really figured out their gender identity, if they have any confusion about their gender identity, they would be able to, um, I think they give them some medicine so then that it delays their puberty, so it gives them some time or maybe that some of them just actually go through a transgender procedure so that, that they can grow up in the identity that they feel comfortable in. And this is a very complex issue. We're talking about kids growing up, puberty, gender. There's so much complexity within gender that we have to understand that moving forward. We always talk about the gender gap. I would like to hope that now we kind of all have an understanding of the gap. And one of the things, once you understand the gap, you always say, oh, now we should bridge the gap. Well, well what if there's just no gap? I don't, I don't specifically like talking about the gap or bridging the gap. I like to think forward and think about what happens when there is no gap. <laughs> because I don't believe in this. So this is one of the campaign 
that was launched in the UK a couple of years ago, that is basically a display that only female can see. It's because it's a campaign for girls in developing country who don't have ability to have education. So by having a facial recognition technology, only female can see it, so then that it would kind of project that emotion to the male audience, what it feels like to have a very basic right stripped away from them. I think it's quite powerful. This is a good way of not talking about the gap. This is just say there's no gap, but this is how we transform emotion. And luckily, I like to think that because we're designers, developers, designers, we're design thinkers. We're here to change the world, and then we have the power to craft the future that we live in. It doesn't matter what we do. And this is a gift, really. Well, for one, I can stand on a stage and talk about this for 30 minutes, which is pretty awesome. So, you know, we have the ability to change the world that we actually live in. I want to talk a little bit about communication. So, this is how a person is projected. Only 7% of it is verbal. 55% is nonverbal. And the nonverbal part means how I'm talking. You know, my gesture, my expression, the look on my face. This is the nonverbal part. And the paraverbal one, this is about the pause and the silence and the melody. And this is all how you get projected. And this is a very old communication theory about how one projects itself. But basically, you cannot not communicate. As I exist, stand on stage, or not on stage, anywhere, I cannot not communicate. I am here communicating. Anything that we're doing is communicating. It's kind of like, kind of restricting in a way. Good thing that there's a thing called internet. You know, on the internet, there's really that your project itself is not anything restricted to anything anymore. The person that you're falling in love with might actually be the 40-year-old weird dude living next door with the seven cats. Real story. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. But <laughs> there's a progression in the thinking. Back in the days, we have a very gender-biased kind of market, and it would become a more gender-targeted. That's where we are now, more so, maybe. And in the future, I believe that it will be a more emotional-focused way. Hey, it's not about gender anymore. We don't have to target in the way that we have targeted people before. We don't have to treat each other in that kind of bias before. It's basically, there's a disappearance of the baseline. There's no more baseline of what gender really means and how people are supposed to be. How nice would that be? I think I would quite like that. Because the truth is, this is all I really want to talk about. I want to talk about sex. I, don't, I want to remove the baseline of gender, attraction, all of this. Because why does it have to be so strict? Why does everything have to be so in a way that I have to be attracted to a male that has a truck, that has big muscles? Or, you know, even if you are in a different group, you know? Why do you have to be attracted to a very specific thing? It should be something more about survival that is more instinctual instead of all these layers that the culture and the history has given us. There's three different things. There's, this is projecting into the future. So emotion-driven goals. Did you know that there's 436 questions on the questionnaire from Match.com? That's how you find true love. Not on Tinder. This is it. Because we think this is how we find love. This is how we define the baseline of who we are. Based on your gender, based on this, 436 questions. How would you describe yourself? How would you describe your relationship, your family? Who cares? It's not about that. The future is our devices as humans, 
And I want us to see a world where that we can fall in love with our devices. So how does that really work? Because our phones or our devices around us are starting to be more sensitive to our feelings. They are more responsive to how we feel. I do this a lot, I'm not kidding. Do you love me, Siri? Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> Sorry, I did, I, I, I'll take that back. Sometimes, she, sometimes Siri tells me he loves me, but, um, but devices uh, are more sensitive to our emotion now. So the, one of the examples is um, there's a GPS system. You know how you are driving around with your GPS and it's like turn left, turn right, turn left in the next left, blah, blah, blah. And then sometimes you'll be yelling back at it. You've done it. You, you just admit you've done it because I do it all the time. And I'm like, no, I don't want to turn. No, no. Why didn't you tell me earlier? And so they develop a GPS system that actually detects your emotion. So that you, when you say, no, I don't want to turn left. And it's like, okay, we will do it your way. I thought, Really? My way? Really? Thanks. <laughs> it's nice. So, device is human. So, if we kind of, if we de design for the future to treat devices as human, we will be able to reach the day where we can have more connection with our devices. And in the very, very end, we have a singularity love. Because once you fall in love with your machines, your machines will never die, and um, the love basically lives on forever. And that's from the movie Her. I, I cry every time I watch it, because I, I want that. <laughs> I, I, I want that. I want, it's not so much about the loneliness, it's about that this is called, this is the singularity. It's that emotion that I have invested with my devices, with my technology, that it will live on forever. Instead of having a baseline of gender or have a baseline of emotion, it, will have, it won't even have a baseline of time. We strip away the baseline of everything and the love lives on forever. Remember my tree? Could I marry my tree? Probably, yeah. It's because there's no gender baseline, and then there's no baseline for anything else, and I should marry my tree. So thank you.